Genesis chapter 2 verse 15. Here's how death came into the world. The Lord God took the man, this is verse 15, and put him in the, into the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. Now, by the way, I, here's, if you want a hobby while I'm reading this, if you just mind, if your mind wants to do something while I'm reading this, Start with the word of in verse 16. And the Lord God commanded the man saying, start with that word of. And every word that you see, I want you to count that word. Of is number one. Every is number two. Tree is number three. Uh, of is number four. The is number five and so on. Okay. I want you to count those words. This is what God said. Of every tree of the garden, thou mayest freely eat. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, Thou shalt surely die. Raise your hand if you have the number of words. Megan. 39. Who else had 39? Raise your hand if you had 39. Raise your hand if you had a different number. You're not going to raise your hand. It's 39 words. How many books are there in the Old Testament? The law? 39. Do you think that's an accident? Because right here is the first commandment that attaches the death penalty to it. The whole rest of the Old Testament is one commandment after another where God says, don't do this, don't do that, don't mess with this, don't hang around these people, don't let your sons marry these daughters, don't let your daughters marry these sons. I mean, it's one commandment after another and every one of them has the death penalty to it. The Old Testament, Paul calls it the law of sin and what? Death. So is it any wonder that, I mean, if you ask me, do I believe my King James Bible is perfect? When I read stuff like that, doggone it, it is. Because the first law God gives us matches the number of books in the Old Testament law that God gave to Israel. And the whole thing was death, 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 death. Break God's commandments, you will die. The whole thing was. So, uh, I don't have this in my notes, but look over in chapter... I mean, we know, that we know what happened. Uh, verse 6, When the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, the tree desired to be make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her husband with her and he did eat and the eyes of both of them were open and they knew they, they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? Now, do you know why God said that? God knew exactly the, the geolocation of Adam and Eve. He knew exactly where they were. But he says, where art thou? He's, staying, he's stating to them, you are now lost. You're lost. And because you're lost, you die in that state. You're going to die twice. Let's go down to Romans Road for a minute. Romans 3.23 For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. 
Romans 6, 23. In fact, we can stop right there. For the wages of sin is death. So why is it that every body we know and everybody we don't know, why is it they die? Sin. Plain and simple. It's sin. We often wonder when people that we love, when they die, we say, why did they die? They had to. They had to. Everybody has to die because everybody has sinned and the wages of their sin is death. Let's pray. Father, I ask your blessings on this message. Lord, I don't know how to preach it. I pray, dear God, that you would help me this morning. Lord, speak to somebody's soul this morning. Help them to understand. Father, there's a difference in how different people look at death. And help us to understand that, Father. Just bless the message however you want to do it. And I pray this in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, Amen. I'm going to try to follow my notes here. Turn to Hebrews chapter 9. Now, we are um, we're headed to Fort Smith. I asked the pastor... Uh, give me some ideas and some things you want me to talk about. He, he mentioned some things and he mentioned UFOs. Now, I'm not going to preach that this morning, but I, let me tell you something. I, I get it now. I, I have researched the UFO as a movement. And I can tell you that 90, prob I'm just a guess, but 90% of people who are in the UFO movement have been taught either by their gurus or by the spirits themselves that there is no such thing as death. Now, are they right? No. And where did, where did they get that idea from? Did they get it from the Martians? Are there Martians out there living on another planet where on this planet nobody ever dies? Is that where they got it from? No, they got it from the same place that the, that the Hindu people got it from, that the yoga people got it from, that the uh, New Agers got it from, that everybody else got it from. Is that, yeah, even though you die, you're going to live again. You're going to come back and live a different life. And, and sometimes you might even remember the past lives that you've lived. That is a lie. That is a lie straight out of hell. If, if you're convinced that even if you die, something in the universe resurrects you and you come back and live another life, then what is there to be afraid of when you die? Nothing. You have taken hell and the second death out of the equation of death. And that's why these people love hearing that when they go to these UFO conventions or they watch these UFO videos or they read these UFO books is that they're being told that there is no such thing as death. And... Some of you think, I'm, oh, he's in that UFO stuff again. Listen, I, I'm, I've spotted a crowd of people that believe a lie, and I want to be the guy standing next to them trying to tell them the truth. Hebrews 9, verse 24. Do you believe the Bible? Say amen. For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands. Don't care how many buildings you build and how many Catholic churches you raise up. I don't care how many temples they build in Jerusalem. He's not going to enter any one of them. When Christ comes down, he's going to build his own temple. Which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for 
us. Isn't that something? I want you to ponder that for a while and I want you to put a smile on your face. Because you know what you have right now for you? A Savior who is standing next to God telling God, don't kill him. Don't send him to hell. Don't do him any harm. His sins are forgiven. Amen. I can amen louder than anybody in this church, apparently. Verse 25. Nor yet that he should offer himself often. That Catholic priest who holds a mass that kills Jesus every time they hold a mass, that's wicked. He didn't die often. He died once. And once is enough. As the high priest entereth into the holy place every year with blood of others. See, they had to do it every year back in the Old Testament. For then must he have often have suffered since the foundation of the world. Did you know that that's why over here at Mercy Jefferson, it used to be Jefferson Memorial. I liked it better when it was Jefferson Memorial Hospital. You know why I liked it better? Because they didn't have a stupid crucifix hanging in every wall and every hallway and every doorway. You know what that crucifix is? It is, read, read that again. Uh, uh, let me go back here. Whoops, whoops. Go back, go back, go back. Um, where did it go? Here it is. For then must he have suffered since the foundation of the world. The crucifix is a Christ who is perpetually suffering on the cross for you and your sins. But that's a lie, isn't it? He only suffered once, and he only had to suffer once. Because his suffering and his blood and his death and his resurrection, one time is all that's necessary to save all of mankind's sins. Somebody say amen. But now once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Now watch verse 27. Look at your Bible or look at the screen. And as it is appointed unto men once to die. But after this. The judgment. So while the New Agers and the yoga people and the Hindu people and the New Age people and the UFO people and all of that bunch claim that you die, you live another life, you die, you live another life, you're getting better every life. And then finally, one of these days, you will be so perfected in life that you will be a god. That's a lie, isn't it? How many times are we appointed to die? What happens after that death? Now I'm going to ask you a question this morning. You just answer it to yourself. Are you prepared right now for that judgment? Are you prepared right now for that judgment crazoids come in churches now and they shoot everybody in the church don't they so what if we were sitting here in church this morning and some nuthead came in guns a blazing and he took out everybody with a gun and then he took out everybody else I'm asking you the question, are you ready to stand before Almighty God in judgment? 
because you only die once. This life that you have right now is your one chance to get it right. One chance. And as it appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment, so Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. Now, in Romans chapter 5, turn there. Romans 5 is a very, very good illustration of what we see in Genesis chapter 2, Genesis chapter 3. It's a, it's a teaching us the doctrine that goes along with the story of Adam and Eve. It teaches us why that because Adam and Eve sinned, that all of us now are born into sin. No one, no one who is born on this earth lives a life free from sin. No one does. There is none righteous, no, not one. Christ is the exception to that verse. So here's what Paul said in Romans chapter 5, starting to verse 7. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. I met a man at Cracker Barrel and we was headed out. And of course he had his military hat on. And so I went up to him and I, I said, sir, thank you for your service. He said, well, thank you for saying that. And I said, I appreciate your service. I said, tell me where you served. He said, actually, he said, I, I joined the army, but he said they shifted me to the, to the National Guard and I served in the National Guard. And he said, you know, I've, the, the National Guard basically are the army guys that stay here to protect the homeland while the other guys go across the sea to go fight a war somewhere else. But that's what the National Guard's here for. And you know what I asked that man? That man was, I don't know, older than me. And we talked a little bit and I said, you know what I, I said, you know what I bet about you? He said, what's that? I said, I bet you'd stand and protect your country again, wouldn't you? He said, you better believe I would. But look at what he's protecting. He's protecting the sodomites. He's, prote he's protecting Nancy Pelosi. He's protecting Hunter Biden. He's protecting all of the sin of America. But this is our home. This is our home. That, look at that verse again. For scarcely for a righteous man would one die. Yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. Verse 12 is the verse I want you to look at. Wherefore, as by one man, Adam, sin entered into the world, and death by sin, so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Do you get it now? Why did, oh, why did so and so have to die? Why did they die? And I'm not trying to be mean. But we're sinners. We're sinners. Everybody that you have known that's already died... 
and everybody that you know now will die. And then you will die. Uh, turn to uh, 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15. Verse 54. For when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Now look at verse 55. O death, where is thy sting? Now when somebody dies and I'm ministering to them, I say to them, and I, I quote this verse. And I say to them, death has a sting to it. And I said, the sting of death generally falls upon those who love the person who just died. Doesn't it sting when somebody you know passes away? Doesn't that hurt? like somebody just stabbed you with a knife. Now eventually, over time, the sting passes away. Not completely. Not until we leave this world. But why? Why? Does it sting? Verse 56. The sting of death. Is sin. And the strength of sin is the what? The law. The 39 words that God said to Adam. The 39 books that God said in the Old Testament. That's the law. The sting of death is sin. And the strength of sin is the law. And because all of us are sinners. When somebody we know dies, it stings, it hurts like crazy. Now, look up on the screen. I've got two things up here. Number one, how the saints deal with death. And how the wicked deal with death. Now, let me read a couple of verses. Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. In fact, read this out loud with me. We all know it. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Greatest words in the whole Old Testament. Somebody say amen. Great words. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Let me tell you about Donna Tippinger. Let me tell you how she died. She had lung cancer in her left lung. Her right lung seemed to be okay. And I'm probably not going to tell this right. So Don, I love you, but that's why I have to write every word down. Because I don't remember often how things are said. But I'm going to do my best. But if I remember right, he said, one day she just said, I, I'm, I don't feel very good. There's something wrong. I, I'm not right. I, I think you need to take me to the hospital. So they got her to the hospital. And they found out that she had a blood clot in her right lung. 
and it had shifted or something like that. It was cutting off blood supply. And that's why she didn't feel good. She wasn't in good shape at all. Now, this woman's been on our prayer list. And let me say this. We don't have to pray for her anymore. God done healed her. Amen. So, and if I read, I can't, there's parts of this I can't remember, but they wanted to take her to a doctor who was a specialist in this. Which meant discharging her from the hospital and I think taking a car ride up to see this doctor or clinic or whatever it was. And she said, I I I'm not going. W why not? She said, I'm not going to make it. And she said, I'm not about to die on the way up. In the car with my family. So that night she started going downhill. They brought the family in, and he, Don said his, his kids, they're all Christian families, all serve the Lord. And he said, When she left this earth, we were all standing around her singing praises to God. Now, let me tell you what happened to that woman. God told her, don't get in that car. You won't need it. And by this time tomorrow, you'll be with me. And you say, oh, I don't know if I believe that. First Thessalonians 5. First Thessalonians 5. You hear me flipping my Bible? Did you see me lick my finger? Anybody, anybody want to ever look through my Bible? See them stains on there? That's part coffee and part licking fingers. I've had, to, I've had this Bible for a while. Oh, let's see here. Verse 4. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. Ye are all children of the light and children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. They called me, Betty Walsh called me, said, come see Lee. He's in the hospital, he's not doing well, Pastor Mike. I left the house, set night, got over there, Betty met me out in the hallway, and she said, now, he's talking out of his head, he just ain't right, don't, I, you know, I just wanted to warn you before you went in there. He just, I don't know, he's just kind of just talking out of his head. He's not making any sense. I walked in that room, Lee sat up. He said, hey, Pastor Mike. And I'm going, he ain't talking out of his head. And I talked to him a little bit, and all of a sudden the man stopped. And he started praying right there in that room. And I let him pray. When he got done, he said this. I'm just making sure. And they called me later that night and said he had passed. He knew. He knew. And I could tell you story after story. My dad said something to my mom. I'm not going to say what it was. That's between them. But the day he passed, God cleared the room to, 
sent the doctors out, sent the nurses out, nobody in that room except for me and him. Dad, you want to pray? Yes, son, let's pray. Last thing my dad did in this world was cry out to God. He knew. They can't tell us that they know because it ain't for us to know, but they know. We had a man here by the name of Bob Fiedler. Godly man. He was due to retire and he went, he was having some real bad chest pains. He went to the doctor and the doctor did a uh, little treadmill deal on him and uh, he didn't do very well. And they said, tomorrow morning you come in here, we're going to do a, a heart catheterization on you. We got to find out what's going on. So I went up to St. Anthony's and was up there and his family was there and we was all cutting up trying to lighten the mood, you know. We didn't know how bad it was. And he, out of, just out of nowhere, Bob said, I just want everybody to know in case something happens to me today, I don't want you to worry about where I am. I'll be with Jesus. And they sent us out of the room, took him down to the procedure room. He never made it off the table. He knew. You see, yea, though you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you will fear no evil. For God will be with you. Isn't that something? Isn't that something to know that when it's your turn to die, God is going to be with you and you will not be afraid. Psalm 18, 4. I'm going to read through this. You can try to keep up with me if you want. Psalm 18, 4. The sorrows of death compassed me and the floods of ungodly men made me afraid. The sorrows of hell compassed me about. The snares of death prevented me. In my distress, I called upon the Lord and cried unto my God. And he heard my voice out of his temple. And my cry came before him even into his ears. You see, even if you are about to die and you call upon God, he'll save you. Amen. And I had a lady years ago in this church. And I mean back in the 80s. She said, she said to me, she said, Brother Mike, she said, Brother Mike, I don't believe in deathbed confessions, do you? Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. This day shalt thou be with me in paradise. That man knew he was going to die. And he called into the Lord his Savior. And, got, and he's there now waiting on us. And he's looking down. And, and if he would hear today, he would say, Why are you afraid? I'm going to say this, and I don't want to be mean. But in my position, I get a lot of emails from a lot of people. And all of them are saying, the Illuminati is trying to kill us all. They're going to kill us all. They're going to, they're going to depopulate the earth. They're going to kill six and a half billion people right off the bat. The, I, I mean it. The Illuminati is going out to kill everybody. We need to stop it somehow. I don't know about you, but I don't want to stop going to heaven. It's like they're scared that they might die. If you're right with God, call unto the Lord. And I promise God will be there with you. He was there with me on the day I thought I was going to die. He was there with me. 
never left my side. I don't know if he felt the electricity that I felt, but he was there. That was a joke. Psalm 33, Behold, the eye of the Lord is upon them that fear Him, upon them that hope in His mercy, to deliver their soul from death and to keep them alive in famine. Our soul waiteth for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. For our heart shall rejoice in Him because we have trusted in His holy name. Let Thy mercy, O Lord, be upon us according as we hope in Thee. That's how saved people look at death. Amen. For this God is our God forever and ever. He will be our guide even unto death. That's how saved people see it. Here's how lost people, I think it's the lost people, yeah. No, Psalm 50, attend unto me and hear me. I mourn in my complaint, make a noise because of the voice of the enemy, because of the oppression of the wicked, for they cast iniquity upon me, and in wrath they hate me. My heart is sore pain within me, and the terrors of death are fallen upon me. Fearfulness and trembling are come upon me, and horror hath overwhelmed me. And I said, oh, that I had wings like a dove, for then would I fly away and be at rest. I think that's how lost people look at death. It's a terror to them. Ray Kurzweil, inventor, multimillionaire, works for Google now, working on solving death. And I believe God's going to let him do it for a little while. Because you know in Revelation 9... When, when those devils come out and they sting everybody by the sting of death, for five months nobody dies, but for five months everybody wishes they could die because they're in so much agony and pain and God won't let them die. How'd you like to do that? How'd you like to live through that? Where you want to die and God won't let you Psalm 55, 15, let death seize upon, this is how lost people, let death seize upon them and let them go down quick into hell. You, do you read your Bible? You see that? You know what's going to happen to lost people? They're not coming back to live a better life. God said that when the wicked die, death is going to seize them and they're going to go quick into hell. Like the rich man. He died and immediately he lift up his eyes being in torment. I wonder if that's you. I wonder if you died today. Would hell and death seize on you so quick. You wouldn't have a chance in the world to repent to God. And you know what I think? I think God looks at people and says, you know what? For some, I know that they're going to call on me when it's their time to die. And others, I'm not even going to give them a chance. They live so wickedly. In God will I praise His word. In the Lord will I praise His word. In God have I put my trust. I will not be afraid of what man can do unto me. Did you read that? Hey, all you conspiracy people out there, did you read that? That believes everybody's out to kill you? I am not afraid of what man can do unto me. The va thy vows are upon me, O God. I will render praises unto thee. For thou hast delivered my soul from death. Wilt not thou deliver my feet from falling, that I may walk before God in the light of the living? Somebody say amen. Well, that's a, that's a long one there. How many more do I got? Oh, I better read that one. That's the last one. In fact, turn your Bible to Psalm 116 and I'll shut up. And no, after I read this, I'll shut up. <clears throat> Psalm 116. I love the Lord because he hath heard my voice and my supplications. Because he hath inclined his ear unto me, therefore will I call upon him as long as I live. The sorrows of death compass me and the pains of hell get hold upon me. I found trouble and sorrow. 
How many of you, raise your hand, you got saved because you were afraid to go to hell? Raise your hand. Look at there. That's why I did. The sorrows of hell can pass me. Nine years old. You can scare a nine-year-old with hell. Then I called upon the name of the Lord. O Lord, beseech, I beseech thee, deliver me. Deliver my soul. Gracious is the Lord and righteous. Yea, our God is merciful. The Lord preserveth the simple. I was brought low and he helped me. Return unto thy rest, O my soul. For the Lord hath dealt bountifully with thee. For thou hast delivered my soul from death, mine eyes from tears, and my feet from falling. I will walk before the Lord in the land of the living. You know what the land of the living is? That's heaven. It's not the shadow of death. It's the land of the living. I got a song I, I want to sing called Land of Living. I just got to work on it. I believe, therefore, if I have spoken, I was greatly afflicted. I said in mine haste, all men are liars. What shall I render unto the Lord for all those benefits toward me? Is there anything that you're going to take to heaven to offer God for salvation? He's already got it. Verse 14, I will pay my vows unto the Lord now in the presence of all his people. Precious and... Look at this verse. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. I miss Wayne. I miss Wayne Shirk. We bought his RV and I've still got his marine sticker on it and we've left his and Jan's name on the side of it and there's a picture on the mantle of Wayne, Wayne and Jan I almost said Wan and Jane because that's how we always messed it up But it was precious when God called him to be home. Did you know that? You know why? Because God says, I've been waiting on you all this time. And now you're home. Now you're home. I'm going to stop there. I'm going to read that verse again. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. When Sister Bonnie passed away, God said, that's precious. Sister Waymire, Sister Bernice, Brother Charlie Estes, Man, how many sister, sister Betty and sister Betty's husbands? I can't, I can't remember all the names. But it was precious when they left here and went home, and it's going to be precious when you go too. You think about that. God's not mad at you anymore. Amen. Let's bow our heads.